we all stand and uh, stretch, maybe take a deep breath. We're going to worship Jesus. you to worship him.
stop dancing and dreaming. This still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing. Praise the Lord. Joy still comes in the morning. Hope still walks with the hurting. You're still alive and breathing. Praise the Lord. Don't stop dancing and dreaming. It's still good news worth repeating. So lift your head and keep singing. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're so happy to be here, right? Yeah, hallelujah. I know some of you right now are saying, well, I, can't ju I can just, can't wait for Jesus to come back. I'm done, I'm through with this, this stuff, right? You know, some people are saying, I see people posting on Facebook, uh, I just want the Father to take me home. You know, some people are just so exhausted, just so tired, but you know, God doesn't look down on you for just feeling broken, for feeling bankrupt in spirit. Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, and the first thing that he said was, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he said that because whenever we're poor in spirit, not poor in, no, he's not saying it with money, he's saying when we feel like our spirit is bankrupt, that we can lay down and truly accept God's spirit, truly accept God's leadership in our life. Whenever the Pharisee and the tax collector went to the place of worship and the tax collector said, thank you, God, that I have all this money I can tithe. Thank you, God, that I follow you, that I fast, that I'm, you know, he, he was praising his own spirit. But the tax collector said he, he couldn't even look up to heaven. And he said to God, God, I'm not worthy. And he walked away justified. So when you need God, God will greet you. He will meet you there, and he will give you his spirit. So that's what this song is about. It's a new song, and it's just about accepting God's spirit to lead you, putting your spirit aside, forgetting about all the things that you don't have, and truly letting God lead the way. Spirit, lead me. This is my worship. This is my offering. In every moment, I withhold nothing. I'm learning to trust you. Even when I can't see it, and even in suffering, I have to believe it. If you say it's wrong, then I say no. If you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I trust I will obey. I don't want to follow my own ways. I'm done chasing feelings. Spirit, lead me. Oh God, lead me. It felt like a burden, but once I could grasp it, you took me further, further than I was asking. And simply to see you is worth it all.
will bring water from the rock to satisfy my thirst, to love me at my worst. And even when I don't remember, you remind me of my word. I don't trust my ways. I'm trading in my thoughts. I lay down everything. Cause you're all that I want. I land in all my knees. This is the cup you have for me. And even when it don't make sense, I'm gonna let your spirit
Jesus fly where there's freedom in the open sky and my hope will never cease or die take me Stay standing. I only just talk for like a minute. You can do this. I believe in you. <laughs> hey, my name is Bethany. I'm the outreach pastor here at the Rock Church, and I want to welcome you this morning. If you're visiting with us, we are so excited that you chose to walk in our doors, and God has you here for a reason. I pray that you will be blessed and encouraged in his word and just enjoy the worship. It's just an amazing, it's an amazing place to be in God's presence. We would love to know that you were actually here. Hope, I try to get around and meet people, but I don't always make it to everybody. So if you wouldn't mind going to our website, which is yourrock.org, click on that little I'm new box and just put in your information there so I can send you a text. Pastor Terry can send you a text. We just want to connect with you and answer any questions you might have. And hey, you just never know what God's going to do. I also want to give you this opportunity to worship with us in giving. God just, he pours out blessings upon blessings upon blessings. And he says, the more we give, the more we receive. So this is your opportunity to give. You can put cash or checks in the little green metal boxes in the back. There's one like right by the door. There's another one out at the Welcome Center. Or if you want to give online, that little blue circle comes up on every single page on our website. You can click there. It takes like two seconds. It's super fast and easy. So that goes directly into our ministry here at The Rock, reaching our community and our mission. I almost forgot. Help me out here, guys. Our mission here at The Rock, helping families, changing lives. That's right, because God is awesome, and we want everyone to know about it. So let's continue to sing and worship God today.
Amen. How many know that's easy to sing but hard to live? I want to know you no matter what the cost. And I think about that and I'm like, wow, God, do I really mean that? That I want to know you no matter what it costs me. And we're living in a day and an age where it seems like it's getting a little more expensive, but I'm glad that you've come out this morning and joined in worshiping God and praising God and magnifying Him. And it's worth it. How many know it's worth it? Glory to God, to love Jesus Christ and to be forgiven, to be washed by our sins. It's just the most amazing thing that we can ever experience in our life is to be forgiven and to know him like we have that chance to know him. Man, I'm so glad you're here today and so awesome to see you here. I got a few announcements that I got to run through here this morning and just let you know about because I have some opportunities. We have a new small group that's starting this Wednesday if you'd like it. I kind of mixed two of them. It's called Get Fit, Get Healthy. And also dealing with depression and anxiety, because as I was sitting there thinking about it, I was like, well, these are all tied together. How many know if your body's not healthy, you get depressed? How many know if your mind's not healthy, your body's not going to be healthy? How many know if your spiritual man isn't alive, the whole thing's all messed up? So we're going to be talking about a spectrum of things, we're going to be studying some things, learning some things, and I don't even know how long this small group's going to last. It might last a while, and it might be really short, I don't know, but it's going to be interesting. So if you'd like to participate, please see me after church, because we do have a little bit of room left, and, and just talk to me, because I threw away all the sheets, so they're all gone. So just talk to me about that after church. And then I've got something else for you. We've got some serving opportunities. You know, the Bible says, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over right? And I got some opportunities. If you'd like to be involved, we got some opportunities to serve. We need a safety team leader. We need somebody who will coordinate our safety in the church and all that kind of stuff. And then we need safety team members, people that will keep everybody safe. I don't know. I never thought I'd ever have to worry about safety teams in a church, just to let you know that. So awesome. I got some volunteers ready. Cool. Talk to me after church if you'd like to be part of that. I need people to keep people safe. Glory to God. And yes, we want it to be safe. And then the next thing we need some greeters just to shake hands and stuff like that. I've kind of taken over as the hospitality team leader because I want to greet everybody who walks in the door. And I like holding the door open. I like harassing the kids and all that kind of stuff. It's so fun. I'm really enjoying myself. Some don't even want to walk in the door anymore. I'm like, wow, that's bad. <laughs> I think she takes after her mother. I'm not sure, but we'll find out later. Glory to God. So we need some pizza makers. If you'd like to learn how to make pizza, we need some people that want to learn to make pizza because we've been getting better at it. If you got a pizza this week and it wasn't super great, I apologize. Our oven shot off again in the middle of the production and I was like, oh, here we go again. So I guess I have to call a repairman and replace parts because I've done everything I know how and everything he's already told me to do. So we've got to get it fixed. But they were good. It's just, I'm like, boy, they're taking a long time. And I'm like, oh, it's off again. So we finally got it down. We've learned how to make them. We've got the dough, we've got the sauce, we've got the cheese, we've got the pepperonis, we've got it all figured out now. Now we just need our oven to just come along with us and work with us. And also some donut shop volunteers. If you'd like to learn to make donuts or volunteer or make coffee and wait on people, we'd love to have you doing that kind of stuff. Because how many know it's a lot of serving? Glory to God. And then we're going to do something really fun. We're getting ready to do a fun center. Glory to God. I keep saying that and people are like, are we ready yet? I'm like, gosh, there's still more stuff that needs to be done. So we're working as fast as we can to get all the stuff done and get all the pieces in place. And there's a reason why we're delaying it. This is my theory. I want to have a wow factor. I don't want people to go in and go, well, this is pretty cool. I want to have everything in place that when they walk in, they go, wow, this is really cool. Not like, yeah, it's okay. It's kind of cool. I want them to have everything done, everything in place. We got another auto blayer back this week. They're all certified now and all hanging now and all that kind of stuff. I'm getting the rock climbing area done. We're going to start working on video games this week and do all that kind of stuff. So we're going to be ready for it. But we have one more opportunity we need some help with. We got a youth group this week, Neon Nights. We're going to launch our youth group this Friday. We're going to be opening up the church, and we sent flyers out to Kiski. We sent flyers out to, I think they went into Leechburg, I hope. Yes, they did go into Leechburg. We sent them into Apollo Ridge. So we want to become a church that loves kids, right? Loves teenagers. I wish I would have had a cool youth group like this when I was a kid. And I mean that with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind. We've got people. We've got a team built around it. We've got a leader. Ben's going to be our leader. Stand up, Ben, so everyone knows who Ben is, because some may not know Ben. This is Ben. 
You can call him Big Ben, glory to God. But that's Ben. He's into weightlifting and stuff. So we've been doing all these kind of things because we want a place for your teens to be. We want a place for your kids to be. We want a place for your family to hang out because our world is crazy. Glory to God. But God's not crazy. And that's the coolest part, that God's not crazy. So I want to get in the Word of God this morning. And I want to talk about, again, one more time, running to win or run to win. And I just want to ask you to open up with, or pray with me and just believe that God's going to move. Father, I thank you. God, for this opportunity to be here, this opportunity, God, to speak life into people. God, I thank you that they've entrusted their time, Lord, to hear what you have to say through me. And God, I thank you that they're part of this body of believers. God, I pray this year in 2021 that you will so radically change us and so radically change, Lord, the church world that God will never believe at the end of this year what you've done and how you've done it. God, I know you're up to something amazing. You're up to something mighty. And Lord, you said, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And God, I pray that you'll just give us a supernatural rest in our spirits, a supernatural rest in our hearts. And then God, when we get that rest, that you'll just supernaturally empower us to be a people, Lord, that are excited with you and thrilled to know you and thrilled to love you. And God, we'll give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor and the worship in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. I'm really glad you're here this morning because I'm talking about run to win, but I've been talking about and building something different, and I've been talking about it for a while, and that's Tsunami 2021, and God just keeps speaking this into my heart. Now, this goes with running to win or run to win, because if God changes you and touches you with a tsunami, I want to tell you what, you're going to run like you've never run before. You're going to learn to serve like you've never served before. And I was out praying early this morning. We got up at like 5.30 and I was out walking at like 10 and 10 after 6. It was cold this morning. If you weren't up and you thought it was cold inside, it was really cold outside. And I'm out there and man, God just started dealing with my heart and touching my whole prayer time. It was just like so cool. And I'm like, I told my wife, I'm like, I walk back with you. And I'm like, never mind, you just keep walking. I'm going to go this way. And I walk all the way down to where I normally walk. And I, I watched the sun just starting to turn the horizon red and it was so cool because I was standing there and I looked out over and I saw two power plants. I can see two power plant steams from my house that I, I can see them going across the sky and I have a picture of my phone and it, my phone. And it was so cool and I was just like, God, you're so awesome. And he's just speaking to my heart. And this morning, a lot of this message is going to be what God spoke to me this morning. Now, if God's not talking to you, I encourage you to change the channel. And I mean that. Because, you know, people are like, God literally talks to you all the time. He's clearly seen in all creation. The greatest place I have found to hear God's voice, honestly, is in nature. I love nature. I realized that as a kid that, you know, it was like everything in my life. And I've told you this before. I got picked on and teased a lot in school. So all my life, I, I spent a lot of time walking in the woods and just spending time with God. And I met God there in a way that I, I never knew I would meet God in those woods. Seriously, just seeing squirrels and tracking deer and, and seeing all the different animals and the cricks and, and all the things that I played in and walked through and all the things that I did and the science experiments I did in cricks. Because my goal, I wanted to become a forest ranger or a wildlife biologist. And I was actually accepted to the University of Wisconsin to go and become into wildlife biology and it didn't happen somehow I ended up in electronics and God had a whole different plan for my life because God didn't want me to play with animals God wanted me to preach the gospel and you know it's the greatest thing I ever did but still when I get alone with God in the woods it's just so amazing the road I walk is there's hardly any matter of fact I didn't even pass a car this morning there's just none on it and I, I live right beside Crooked Creek and I got to walk down and look over Crooked Creek and it was in my picture this morning and God just started speaking. I want to take you on a journey this morning that God kind of took me on and that God was dealing with me and a lot of this message I had built and God just kind of put, I guess, the cherry on top of it this morning as I was out there. And I pray that it will minister to your life. I want you to know this. God is up to something so amazing on this world that it's crazy. I was out praying this morning. I was thinking about a, a preacher and I couldn't think of his name, and I told my wife, and I was praying with my wife, and I couldn't think of his name, and then I was walking, and God just gave me his name, because I thought it started with a C, and I was thinking of Charles Pran, and it's not Charles Pran, and all of a sudden, God spoke to my heart, and it was Evans Roberts, and I don't know if you know anything about Evans Roberts or not, but he was in England, UK, is where he was at, at the turn of the century, 1890s, right in that time frame, 
and 1900s, and he was just a young man, but that man, if you know nothing about the revival, the awakening, they called it a great awakening in that land, and it was predominantly coal and steel and all those things, and he was this young man that got so full of God that he literally changed a nation in two years. If you never don't know anything about him, it was so powerful that pubs shut down. How many know you can make any law you want to, but if nobody does it, it doesn't matter? It was so amazing that that, that area was a coal area, and they had to close the coal mines and retrain the donkeys because the donkeys and the mules no longer would do the commands of the coal miners because their lives were so radically changed that they used to talk with, to them in so many curse words and so many ways that when they stopped doing that and God changed their life, the mules didn't know what to do. So they literally had to close the coal mines and retrain the mules to the new commands so that they would carry the coal out of the coal mine. I'm like, now how many know that's a pretty crazy revival? I mean, that's, it was, the churches got so full that they would literally open the windows and people would stick their heads in the windows to see and to hear Evans Roberts as he preached the gospel. Now, God wants to do some crazy new things in your life. And he was only around for two years, and I won't get into the reasons why, but let's get into this a little bit and get into scripture. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus and the disciples are standing at a place that is Caesarea Philippi, which was literally called the gate of hell. That's what they called it. There was a, literally a, a, a river that flows out of the mountainside and begins to flow down. And I, I did this message before, but I just want to remind you. And they were standing there, and in this conversation, Jesus is going to show them some of the deepest things of God that he ever revealed. And this is what he says. He says, God bless you. And he, he looks at Simon and he says, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're this. Some say you're that. And he asked, and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, the big mouth disciple said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And this is Jesus' answer. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. And I'm using the message. And you'll understand why I'm using the message in a minute. Because it just blew me away as I read it. He says, you didn't get the answer out of books or from teachers. Now, I want you all to get something right there. You don't find the Spirit of God and the moving of God in a book or from a teacher. It is an experience. Now, so many people have been caught into religion where religion is the experience. Well, I go to church and, you know, the pastor preaches or the priest does this or I do that or whatever. And that's what it is. But God is so much more than that. God wants to personally meet you. God wants to radically change your life from where you are into something you've never seen before. Something you don't even know that you can become. He wants to so make you a radical that it is so crazy that what God wants to do in your life that you just stand there and you shake your head and go, I never knew God could do this kind of stuff. He goes on and he says, my father in heaven, God himself, lets you in on this secret of who I really am. Notice it's a secret of who I really am. And he's let it into him because he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. He's the, the Savior. He's that, the God that everyone was looking for, that Jesus, that hope, that everything. That's who he is. And he goes on and he says this. He says, and now I'm going to tell you who you all really are. You are Peter, a rock. That's really cool. Everyone thinks that he was sitting there saying that you were going to be the rock, the foundation of the church. And to a certain extent, Peter was. But we can get caught on all that kind of stuff. What he was saying is, you are a stone. You are something that can be built upon. Remember what he said? A wise man builds his house upon the rock. A foolish man builds his house upon the sand. He's saying, this is the rock. This is the rock right here. The revelation of I am the Messiah. I'm more than just a good God. I'm more than just a prophet. I'm more than just a, a religious symbol. I'm more than just a picture on a wall. I'm more than just a cross on your neck. I'm more than just a crucifix that you carry around or one that you hold there to ward off demons and chase them away. I'm more than that. I am the Messiah. I'm the son of the living God. And he says when you get that revelation, you can start building on it. But he said something greater, and he went into this, and this is what he says. This is the rock on which I will put together my church. I love this. A church so expansive with energy. I was reading that and I was like, God, that's really cool. I want to be a church so expansive with energy. I wonder how many of you have energy this morning. I'm not talking about natural energy, you know, but I'm talking about energy where it's like some people start talking to you about, you know, they're like, are you a Christian? Your eyes light up. 
And you're like, oh, you want to talk about God? That's my favorite subject. It's like, you know, every time they say you feel like, like Jeremiah the prophet, there's a fire within my bones. And I'm like, you know, don't get me started. And they're like, oh, man, I wish I wanted. But it just flows out of you. Why? Because you're expansive with energy that God wants to energize us. And if you don't have that, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to tell you, plug in. I want you to get that. Now, God's got outlets all around you. God is the outlet all around you. But you can't get this unless you're willing to plug in. Now, when you plug into something, I want to tell you that when, whether you like it or not, all around us right now, there is energy. As I was watching those power plants this morning, they're building energy. It's available. If you don't turn on the switch, you don't have any lights. Everyone understand that? If you don't pay the power bill, you won't have any lights. How many know it cost us something to have power in our house? It cost us something to use the energy. You used the energy of your car this morning, and we'll get into that in a minute. But he said it's, it's energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. In other words, it's so powerful, and there's so much energy in this thing that the gates of hell can't stop it. And as I looked out over those power plants and there's steam going out of them, I remember talking about a guy, and I know there's a lot of debate right now about clean energy and all this kind of stuff. Can I tell you something? Coal is really clean anymore. I mean, if you didn't grow up in the 70s like I did, you needed to come visit the 70s. That's so all I can tell you. And I was watching the power plants out there, and I remember as I was talking to someone who used to come to our church who worked at one of the power plants nearby, we were talking about clean energy, and we were talking about wind energy. And I, listen, I believe in energy. I believe in windmills. I believe in all that sun stuff. If you buy sun and invest in sun energy in Western PA, I think you're pretty stupid. Because you got to have sun to have sun energy, just to let you know that. We don't get very much sun here, just to let you know. All right, we got a mountain range right over there, and all the clouds love to hit, and we have, whether you like it or not, the average sunny days in Pittsburgh are 56. Now you know why it's so gloomy all the time, don't you? So to invest in solar energy here, I don't think is the greatest thing in the world. You live a little further that way or a little further that way, maybe it's a great idea, but where we live, we just... One thing about it, we don't have to worry about getting a lot of sunburn. Just let you know, that's the good side of it. Skin cancer is on the downside. All right? So as I was sitting there thinking about it, I was talking to this man that day. I was talking to him about how much power Keystone Power Plant generates. And he said something to me which really amazed me. He said, do you realize it takes 72 windmills running all day long to generate the same power that Keystone Power Plant makes with one generator in one hour? Now, can you say that's a lot of electricity? I thought about that. I'm like, that's a lot of power. Whenever I think that there's 72 windmills spinning all day long to equal one generator. And if you know anything about uh, Keystone, I believe there's four generators that are actually in that plant. And forgive me if I'm wrong, there's either two or four. I don't remember the exact number. And I was like, that's crazy. That's a lot of power. And I thought about that, and I thought about how God says the same thing. God, God says, there's a power source that... You know, we can get into church, and we can get into religion, we can get into the Bible, we can get into prayer, and you can get a little bit of energy. But God doesn't want you to get a little bit of the energy. You know what God wants you to get? God wants you to get a lot of the energy. God wants you to experience a power plant energy. And I was sitting there as I was praying about this and thinking about this, God started talking to me again about this tsunami. And he said, so I'm a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And God started speaking to my heart. And as I was walking and praying and talking to God and all that stuff, God gave me a crazy vision this morning. And I'm out walking the road, and I'm just, man, I'm having a time. I mean, my eyelashes are all freezing together because, you know, I'm crying before God, and I'm, like, trying to keep my eyes from sticking together because they were freezing and all that kind of stuff. And it was cold. It was, like, 10 degrees outside. I'm like, this is, baby, it's cold out here. And when you walk down the Crooked Creek where the water is, by the way, it gets colder, just to let you know that. And I'm down there, and I'm like, and all of a sudden, God painted me a picture. And, and God said, Terry, this is the tsunami I'm going to do. And I've been praying a lot about the tsunami. I'm like, God, what are you up to? I want to know what God's up to, don't you? Now, listen, if I look at the world and the news media and everything around me and COVID and all that kind of stuff, I want to tell you something. It's pretty crazy, but how many know God's bigger than that? How many know God doesn't care who's in office and senates or congressmen or locally or, or presidents or people overseas or anyone like that? God doesn't care about that. How many know God's God? 
And when you worship God, he is not bound by the laws of man. And as I'm walking, and God's like, Terry, and he kept bringing me that scripture, the church is so expansive with energy that nothing will stop it. How many know that energy is crazy? One of my favorite guys to read about is Tesla. Anyone else ever read about Tesla? Anyone study Tesla? You know, he was able to transport energy without power lines. To this day, they have no clue how he did it. Then he made these orbs and, and made electricity flow through air and did things that are like crazy that he died with the secrets of and all that kind of stuff. He was out there. Man, this guy understood things. And he got in a big war with, with DC and with, with, not with DC, but with DC current. And, and everyone knows Westinghouse won out because you all got AC current now. And you know of Westinghouse, but you don't know of Tesla. Well, I guess that's a car now, right? So you can get a Tesla car, but that doesn't even compare to what the guy Tesla, he was literally an amazing, amazing man. To this day, we can't figure out how he did stuff, and I don't want to get into all that, but he was just, he understood power to a different degree of anyone else in the world that possibly ever has, and by the way, it was the turn of the century. So I was sitting there and I was praying about this and I'm like, okay, so I went to my office and I started looking for a picture of what God showed me and I had to build my own. So this, I'm going to try to explain to you what God showed me this morning. God said, Terry, this is what I'm ready to do. I am pouring out supernaturally upon the earth and God literally showed me as I was walking this this pot, and I didn't see hands, but I, I saw this pot, and I saw it being poured out, and God's like, I'm going to cause a tsunami that is going to be so great, and I will pour out my spirit, and he showed me as it was being poured out and hitting the earth, it was like, just, how many know when you pour out a lot of water, it splashes everywhere? How many know when you pour out a lot of water, it runs everywhere? And I remember sitting there, and, and, and I'm not sitting there, but I'm walking, and I'm like, God's like, this is what I'm going to do, Terry. I'm going to pour out so much of the Spirit and so much of my anointing and so much of my presence that it's going to flow and nothing's going to be able to stop it. It doesn't matter what man tries to do. It doesn't matter how man tries to shut it off. It doesn't matter whether people believe it or not. I'm just going to start dumping it out, and it's going to be a pouring out of my Spirit. And I was like, God, this is getting cool. And I was sitting there, and I'm like, God, I, I just can't wait. I don't know about you, but I'm like, and it, remember I told you a few weeks ago, I said when God does this tsunami, he is going to move things that are not built upon the rock. The things in our own lives are going to be washed away. You see, all of us have things in our lives that, let's just be honest, God's not real thrilled with. You know, we, we like to keep around our pets. And I'm not talking about our dogs and our cats. I'm talking about the pet things. And Paul referred to it like this, the sin that does so easily grab a hold of you. The sin that does so easily beset you. You know, the little things that we just let hang around. That, and we, this is how we justify them. Well, I'm not as bad as. Come on now. You know, someone sits there and says, you got a problem with anger. And you sit there and say, well, I'm not as bad as my aunt. I'm not as bad as my mom. Or we sit there and say, well, it's just part of my family curse. You know, that's just, you just have to understand, this is what I grew up in. And God's like, I don't want those excuses anymore. I want to radically change people from what they were to into what I want them to be so that you become such a testimony of God that when people look at you and people see you, that they're like, what happened in your life? I've had a few moments of those in my life. I remember when I was just a teenager, no, I was probably about 20, 21 years old, somewhere around there, and God got a hold of me. I went to a revival, and, and man, God just touched my life so much, and I was with my girlfriend that night, and I used to be shy, and I used to be backward, and I was shy and backward about God a lot of times, too, and I walked in to Eaton Park that day, and I walked in, and this, this waitress or server, whatever you call them, that seats you, the hostess, and she walked up to me, and I was kind of dressed up, and my girlfriend was in a dress, and she's like, were you at a dance? And I'm like, no, we are a church, and man, did God move, and she's like, Oh, okay. And she walked away. I want to tell you, when God gets a hold of you, it radically changes you. The person I was dating at that time had a mom and dad who didn't like her going to church with me and all those kind of things. And they were always antagonistic against her, but they would never do it when I was there. But they would always do it to her when I wasn't there. And I remember that day that 
we came home from Eaton Park. We were walking out, and I don't even remember where her mom and dad were going and what they were doing, but her dad met me first, and, and he asked me something, and he used to do this a lot to incite violence in my girlfriend's life, and he looked at her and said, so what did you learn in church today? Because they knew we were coming from church. I said, oh, I learned about Jesus. It was so awesome. God moved, and his eyes got about this big. And he said, oh, okay, and closed the door and walked away. You know, I walked into the garage and their mom was coming out. Can you believe what question do you think she asked me? The exact same question. What did you learn in church tonight? And I was like, ah! Because God had radically changed me. When God gets his power in you and God does this stuff in your life, he wants to take you from ordinary to extraordinary. He wants, he's never called the church to be afraid. He's never called the church to be scared. Someone needs to hear this. Listen, we don't have to be afraid of what's going on around us. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Oh, I know we quote that all the time, but we don't believe it. Everyone shake your head and go, yes. Listen, I want to tell you what I heard this week. It was tweeted and spoken, it said this from the president. There we realize now there is nothing we can do to slow COVID over the next several months. Now, some people that might scare you. Why be afraid? How many know God's bigger than COVID? Yeah. Glory to God. You know, it amazes me. I'm watching Christians that I grew up with all my life who are sitting there, I'm ready to see Jesus, but now COVID's out there and they're scared to go anywhere. And I'm like, what happened to your faith? They used to be the ones who told me to live as Christ and to die as gain. But now suddenly they want to live more than they want to gain. Now listen, I'm not trying to downplay it. There's a disease. But can I tell you something? Is God bigger than a disease? Is God greater than fear? We've got to realize something. The Bible says don't be afraid. Sure, there's dangers in life. Sure, there's a lot of ways we can die. You can die pulling out of our church today if you don't look to your left and look to your right. You can. Worse things have happened. Things have fallen on people. Buildings have fallen down. Walls have fallen down. Asteroids have hit people. I mean, who knows how you go. But I know one thing. God is in control. And we've got to get back into living again where we believe what God has said in his word. And we believe what God has spoken in his word. And God wants to pour this out on our lives. And he wants to let it overflow out of us. That there's so much in me that it's not just kind of running. If you ever had a sink clog in your house or some kid left the the, the water on and it kind of overflows the sink, it overflows the sink slowly. God doesn't want to just give you a little bit of overflow. God wants to give you a lot of overflow. God wants to change your life. God wants your life to change other people's lives. You see, that's why I want to build a fun center. That's why I want to build an awesome youth group. Our world needs hope. You know how many people in our world right now are scared? You know how many people in our world right now are sitting there saying, man, this is really bad? You know how many people around us are sitting there afraid? We've got the answer. It's Jesus. Now, when you say that to them, they're going to think about religion, so you need enough power to let them know and say, here, grab this. If I got two electrical wires today and I held them out here and they were plugged in the light socket, I said, grab this, I guarantee you would feel something. And if anyone's never tried it, we can get a 9-volt battery. We can pass it around and I'll just let you put it on your tongue. You'll feel something. Why? Because when there's power, you feel something, and we've got to get back into our lives where we're walking with God and talking with God and in love with God, and we're praying and seeking God and talking with God enough that when someone gets around us and they have no hope, they feel something. They don't need counselors. And listen, I'm not opposed to counselors as long as you got the power with it. But how many know that a counselor is just giving you man's ideas? You know, I remember when I first got hired with Xerox and I was working in the hospital, I used to sit there, and this, this was in the 80s, mid-80s, late 80s, and I remember I used to walk in there and I'd find cigarette burns in the copier that I was working on, and I'm like, what? And here'd come the doctor, and he'd have a cigarette in his mouth, and he'd lay it on the copier as he was making copies, and I sit there and thought, wait a minute, he's telling other people not to smoke, and here he is smoking all over the place. He's telling other people how to be healthy, and here he is doing these kind of things. I was sitting there looking, thinking to myself, what's wrong with this picture? 
How many know that's a little weird? You're not allowed to do that today. Just to let you know, the rules have changed drastically from then, thank God. But I was sitting there thinking about that. I wonder how many of us are like that in the spiritual world. Where we sit there and we tell people to have hope, but we're not willing to let God deal with our lives, to get the garbage out of our lives, to have enough power flow through us that when they get around us, they feel something. We sit there and we say, well, you need Jesus, but they don't see Jesus in us as we have our habits sticking in our lips or our habits in our hands or our habits in our pockets or our habits in our hearts or our habits in our minds. And we're sitting there and we're just like that doctor sitting there telling people that you need to get healthy, but at the same time I'm laying my cigarette and burning marks on the copier. I want you to get this. I want you to understand it. God said, I will pour out my spirit. You know, one of the craziest things in the scripture that I read as I read the scriptures when it talks about, and I believe it's the book of Isaiah, where God says that in the last times he begins to talk about when heaven comes down and God lives on earth and all that stuff. And he talks about a river that flows out and he talks about trees of life that there and he talks about how the river that will go down and make the dead sea alive again and all that kind of stuff. But there's the scripture there in the middle of all those things. He says this, he says, but the marshes will not be changed. Now, I remember reading that and going, how many know what marshes are? Not marsha, but marshes. Right? How many know what a marshy, boggy area is? It's an area where, you know what, water is, you don't want to drink it there. It's a place where mosquitoes live, and it's a place where, you know, things live, and snakes live, and creatures live, and stuff grows, and, and water gets stinky and smelly. And and it amazes me as I read that story that it talks about this river of life that flows from the throne room of God, but there's certain areas that will flow to that it says these marshes won't be healed. As I was thinking about that and I was praying and going through all these things this morning, I was like, God, don't let me be a marsh. Don't let me be a person that sits there and just, you know what really a marsh is? A marsh is a way where the water comes in but has no way to go out. You realize if you find a bog, it has a lot of little streams going into it, but it's of such elevation that it has no positive outlet, so therefore the water comes in and it just lays there. And how many ever, you're familiar with this word, it gets stagnant. And I think about it in a spiritual sense that you and I, that, that we can become Christians, that we want everything to flow into us, but if we don't give something back out of our lives, we become stagnant, we become marshy, and we become religious, and we become full of mosquitoes and pesty things that bite and sting and all those kind of things, and snakes creep through it. And, and, and we're not full of life, but we have the ability to have life coming into us, but we don't let anything go out of us. That's a marsh. I don't want to be a marsh. I want to be living water. I want to be something so amazing. Matthew 24, 14, it says, Yet through it all, the joyful assurance of the realm of heaven's kingdom will be proclaimed all over the world, providing every nation with a demonstration of the reality of God. And after this, the end of the age will arrive. I like this one better. Why did I choose the Passion Translation? Because if you're King James Version, I'll tell you what it says. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the land. And after it's preached to all the land, then will the Son of Man come. But I like this one. It says more. There's, there's more to just preaching. If you're anything like me, I grew up in churches where they preached a lot, but they didn't live much. I want that to seek in. They preached a lot, but they didn't live much. In other words, they'd sit there and they'd preach the word and they'd say all these kind of things. But when you look at their lives, they didn't want to live what it said. How many know living what it says is hard? How many know living what it says is abrasive? You can't stay sharp whenever you're a child of God that is being touched by God. God rolls you and God turns you until you're like a river stone that you're all round. Why? And you're not sharp and cutting anymore, but, but you flow and you go with the water and you begin to move and God transforms us just like a gem. We went down to North Carolina and we, the big thing around where my son-in-law and my daughter live are gem mines. I don't know if you ever went to one. 
And you can sit there and you mine it and they give you the dirt and you sit there and swirl it all around and they bring, there's a big pile of dirt from the mine and you never know what you're going to get. And you take it over to them and they're like, well, you got a ruby here, you got a garnet here, you got this here, you got that here. And, and, and I'm looking at it and how many know that that sounds like really cool, I found a rob- ruby, but how many know a rough cut ruby is pretty worthless? How many know a rough cut emerald is pretty worthless? And they're like, this could be a really beautiful necklace. And I said, okay, what would it take to get there? Well, to get that stone there, we would have to take it and we'd have to turn it. And we'd have to tumble it. Anyone in here ever try to tumble a rock when you were a kid? Anyone buy one of those things or get one of those as a science experiment? I said, well, how long does that take? He said, probably about 45 days. 45 days of my little stone spinning around with the abrasive stones inside of it as they start with the rougher stuff and go to the thinner stuff until it's finally polished. And you sit there and I'm like, how much would that cost? He said, a couple hundred dollars. So you're starting to understand the cost, right? Now, I might have an amazing thing. What do you think I did with that ruby? I said, here, Kaylee, have a ruby. Oh, I got a ruby. I don't know what she'll ever do with it. But how many know when we found Jesus, it's the same way? When we find the Holy Spirit, it's the same way. We find something that is precious. We find something that is life-changing. We find something that is amazing. We find something that is glorious. We find something that is powerful. But are we willing to go through the turning and the twisting as God turns us and rolls us and goes through that until he polishes us and he makes us? Or are we going to go halfway through it and go, well, and when you look at where I came from, I'm not as bad as what I am today. That's called cutting short the process. That's called, God, I'm good enough. Well, I want to pray, God, and I want to know you, and I I want you to speak to me. And here's why a lot of people don't like God speaking to them, because he usually speaks what you don't want to hear. Oh, I had an awesome vision this morning of God pouring out the water. But can I tell you a lot of times what he tells me? Some days I go out and I pray after I've been in an argument with my wife or someone else, and God's like, Terry, you have a problem. How many know I don't like it when I have a problem? How many like to be told that you're the problem whenever you're praying about something? How many of you like it whenever you sit there and you're like, well, God, what's going on in my life or why is this happening? And God's like, well, you have this thing in your life that you need to deal with. If you don't deal with it, you can never really become as beautiful as you can be. And you've got to be willing to go through it. Are you willing to go through the pain and the tumbling process? God, can't you just, like, hit me with lightning? Because, you know, that's cool. Anyone ever see sand hit by lightning? You know, they sell it, and it's expensive. It's, like, awesomely transformed as the power goes through, and it melts it into glass, and it looks all cool and all this kind of stuff, and it's valuable if you find that kind of stuff. What well, God, can't you? I would like that better. Wouldn't you like that better? You're just, like, walking along, God, goes, oh, well, I'm changed. I don't know if I want to be a ruby or a diamond that just has to be cut and stone and all the things have to be done to me in order to get me to be beautiful. God, I'm not sure I want to go through that, but God said I will pour out my spirit. And it says providing every nation with a demonstration of the reality of God. This is the heart of God. God doesn't want you to become religious. God doesn't want you to join a church. Joining a church does nothing. That's why we don't even push membership here. People walk up and say, well, what do I have to do to become a member here? And I'm like, um, come. Because, you know, what's a member mean? So, well, you're a member of the church. You're the greatest member of a church I can ever make you of is the church of Jesus Christ. That's really what it's all about. I mean, yeah, we're a group of people who worship at the rock and all that kind of stuff. But if I give you a piece of paper and it says you're the member of the rock, what do we do with that? Start a fire? You know, maybe people sit there and say, well, I'm a member of. Okay. So what's that mean? And you see, if I give you a membership paper, then you think you're like the Knights of Columbus or something like that. And now you, you have rights and you're like, well, now I can walk in and this is my meeting hall. No, it's not. It's God's. And we want God to be in control. We want people to be able to come. In every form and fashion, every form and fashion, I want you to get that, every form and fashion. Some people don't offend you whenever two women come in and they put their arm around each other or smooch or two guys and we're like, should we have them here? Yes, we should have them here. 
Why? Because God wants to change them. Glory to God, you might sit there and say, well, I can't believe they're living together. Well, it's all good. God's changing them. We've got to realize that we don't all just get instantly polished up, that it takes a process and it takes time and it takes work. And by the way, Jesus said, whosoever will, let him, what? Come. That's what he said. I've heard people that walked up to people and said, well, when you... You can't come here until you cut your hair. You can't come here until you get your life in order. What's life in order look like? There's a lot of days mine still feels out of order. And some days I want to hang the sign, out of order. <laughs> Glory to God. What's in order? Oh, you mean we want to look like we've got it together. Well, it's easy to look like it, but how many know that we don't? I've learned something. Your kids throw up on themselves more Sunday mornings and poop their pants more Sunday mornings and spill things on them more Sunday morning and get into more arguments driving to church on Sunday morning than you will most days of the week. That's why a lot of people take separate cars. You might want to try that. I'll see you at church, honey. I love you. See, God wants to do crazy things in our lives, and it's not always fun. So this tsunami is really about people will be the tsunami. I was praying about it, and God gave me this word this week. He's like, Terry, the tsunami is people. People changed by me that will go out and change the world around them. People that are touched by me that will have the anointing of God. How many know you get the anointing of God by people being together? How many know if you read the first outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you'll find it in Acts chapter 2, and it says, and they were all together in one place praying and seeking God, and there was 120 of them, and all of a sudden there came a rushing mighty wind, and it sat upon each of them, and they began to pray in the Holy Spirit, and tongues of fire sat upon them, and they began to prophesy and speak in different languages, and they spoke of the great things God did. What? They were together. It's people God pouring into people, it doesn't do us any good to say, wow, God's really pouring out right there. Jump into it. God doesn't want to do that. God wants to get in people. You are his favorite creation. He wants to live inside of you and breathe inside of you and move inside of you and change your life that when people see you, they look and say, what happened to you? That's the transformation of the Holy Spirit. Oh, pretty cool. Colossians 3, 1 through 2, he says this. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. He says, set your hearts on things above. He says, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. And another one, the message version, I like this one. This is the same scripture. It says, so if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. How many know a lot of people go to church, but they don't act like it. How many know just because you go to church, it doesn't change anything? How many know transformation has to get on the inside before it gets on the outside? I grew up in a church when I was a kid that women weren't allowed to wear pants. They weren't allowed to wear jeans. They weren't allowed to wear shorts. They had to be in dresses. They weren't allowed to wear makeup. Can I tell you, a lot of women need makeup. <laughs> and I was around a lot of women that needed makeup. I'm just telling you straight up, that's truth right there. Some people need all the help they can get to look good. That's what I'm saying right there. Bless God. You paint your house, don't you? Well, bless God. You wash your car. We had a lot of ugly women. And then they try to tell me as a young kid to marry within the church, and I'm like, they're ugly here. So then you go shopping out in the world, and that's bad. But they looked better because they were painted. Glory to God. Some of you say, I can't believe him. <laughs> I speak truth. And you know, I had all these rules. We weren't allowed to go anywhere fun. If it was fun, it was of the devil. That's religion. God wants you to live in the fullness of life. Listen, there's nothing wrong with trying to make yourself look good. There's nothing wrong with being beautiful or being handsome or, man, some people need deodorant more. It, those are good things, praise God. It's, it's good. Toothbrushes are amazing. Glory to God, scope is awesome. 
Mincer of God. Don't turn these things away. Odor eaters are good for your feet. They're of God. It's not of the devil. But at the same time, it doesn't do any good to do all that in the outside when the inside's ugly. There was a movie, I don't know, I guess around 2000-ish, called Shallow How. How many saw Shallow How? If you never saw Shallow How, that is your assignment for the day, to go home and watch Shallow How. Because he has this experience, I think, with Tony Evans. Was that his guy's name? Tony Roberts, thank you. I knew it was one of those speakers. And he touches him and tells him that he needs to see beauty on the inside, and that's what makes things beautiful. And it's kind of a comedy, but, you know, it's a funny, funny movie that they made. But it's truth. And we've got to realize this. What we see on the outward is passing away, but that which is on the inside is going to live forever. And that's God in our lives, and that's our personalities, and that's who we are, and, and the way we think. And that's the eternal man that lives in all of us. This is going to die. It looks good, but it's going to die. And we've got to realize that. And we spend so much time trying to make the outside. But when I was a kid, they didn't never realize that and never understood that, you know, people need help on the outside and people need help on the inside. God wants to change the world. And he says this. He says, act like a pursue things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along with eyes to the ground, absorbed with things right in front of you. How many know that's easy? How many know it's easy right now to get caught with things right in front of us? How many know it's easy to get led astray by a world that is, feels like it's gone insane? But you know what? We, the church, are supposed to be the anchors. We're supposed to be the rocks. We're supposed to be the ones that, how you doing today? I'm doing good. You're not scared? No, I'm not scared. God got this. What if I die? You're going to. I just want to tell all you that a hundred years from now, none of us are going to be around. And if you're around, you won't want to be around. Because everything you have won't be working the way it is now. We're all going to get out of this world sooner or later. We're all going to die. But we're going to live in Jesus Christ. Ah, oh, He goes on and he says, absorb with things right in front of you. He says this, he says, look up and be alert to what God is, is going on to what is going on around Christ. Yeah. Look up and be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. Look up. We need to have our eyes on other things. He said, see things from his perspective. That's where all of us need to live. A church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. I wonder this morning, if I had a voltmeter, Everyone know what a voltmeter is? It's a meter. Some call them ohm meters, amp meter, voltmeter. What's it do? It tells you where electricity is and tells you where electricity isn't. It tells you where resistance is and it tells you where resistance isn't. It tells you where energy is flowing and it tells you where there is no energy flowing. That's basically what it is. It's called a meter. Once sometimes we had spiritual meters. Then we walk up to somebody and I just was going to say stab them with it. But you walk up and you can probe them and see what they've got inside. You can check the resistance to the Holy Spirit. You know, we get resistance. Some of you walk in and like, well, bless God, I know Pastor Terry's going to tell me to raise my hand. I ain't raising my hands. That's resistance. I know they're going to try to get me to stomp my foot. My foot ain't moving, bless God. God, I love you, but it ain't moving. That's resistance. Whenever God sits there and says, go and say you're sorry, and you're like, I'm sorry, but I'm not. You're a sorry butt. How many ever met a sorry butt? They're the ones who walk up to you and say, I'm sorry, but you should have done that to me. Kids are notorious for that, aren't they? Go tell your brother you're sorry. I'm sorry, but I'd hit you again. <laughs> We've got to realize that, that we need to realize what is in us. We, and it takes honesty. 
I wish we had spiritual skills. You know, you get on one and you go, oh, I need to go on a diet. Oh, I'm doing okay. Oh, I need to eat more food, whatever. But wouldn't it be cool to have like a spiritual scale that you stood on and said, dude, you have issues. We do. It's called the Word of God. We do. It's called the Holy Spirit. We do. It's called conviction. So as I began to sit there, I want to get close. Energy never just happens. It is created. And this is what you have to understand, that it is created. It takes motors. It takes a, a, a generator. It takes a steam generator. It takes a hand generator. It takes one something. It takes fire. It takes water. It takes wind. Or it takes sun. See, energy has to be created. Energy is never just there. We can have all the wiring, all the plugs, all the outlets, but how many know if it's not connected to an energy source, it does nothing? How many know you can have a car all together, but if there's no gas in the gas tank, you aren't going because it's not going to make the fire? You can even have an electric car, but if it's not charged, it won't move. How many know that? You know that. She's got an electric car, and if it doesn't charge... How many know you've got to have energy? So many people in the church world, they, they want God, but they don't want the energy source. You've got to hook into it. And by the way, it's created. How is it created? Uh, so all references to the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 1, God says, God is clearly seen in all of creation. God created fire. God created wind. God created sun. And God created the water. It all produces energy. It all takes God to be involved in it. I will put this. Since energy is created with the proper equipment, and I'm closing, we need the proper equipment as well. It takes an attitude. It takes obedience. It takes giving. It takes serving. It takes praying. It takes attending. It takes being uncomfortable. It takes worshiping. It takes conviction. So what I'm going to do now is I talk about run to win through the next weeks. We're going to talk about attitude. We're going to talk about serving. We're talking about all the things that create energy within you. If the things we don't do, I'm Bible reading. If you don't read the word, you'll be deceived and things will happen in your life where you'll build resistance and you'll never feel the presence of God. If you don't sit there and understand, so many people want God to talk to them, but they don't want to be convicted. Conviction is the greatest privilege you have in the world. It's to have God tell you you're wrong. And yet it's something the church doesn't want anymore. We want to feel good. We want to shout. We want to sing good songs. We want to clap our hands. We want to praise God. We want to go to concerts and watch the light show and go, whoa, Jesus showed up. But we don't want God to say, dude, you have issues. Can I tell you something? The closer you get to God, the more issues you're going to find. The closer you get to God, the more things you're going to find out that you have to work through that are stopping the move from God. If you aren't feeling God, and yeah, I know I'm talking about feelings. I grew up in a church where they used to say it's more than just a feeling. It is more than just a feeling, but how many know that if I don't feel something, I get tired of it? You know how many people fall out of love? You know why we fall out of love? Because we quit doing the things that cause love. We get used to each other. We get used to the relationship. We get lazy. And we do the same thing with God. We sit there and we get lazy with our walk with God. You know how easy it is to be distracted of reading your Bible? You know how easy it is to be distracted of carrying on a prayer time? You know how easy it is to be distracted by serving and giving? Serving stinks. But it builds power. I want to tell you, if you think I walk in every day and go, yay, I get to preach today. There's a lot of days I go, yay, I get to preach today. Yippee, I get to teach today. Yay. But how many know if you serve, God works? It's not always fun fixing somebody's car with them, but you know what? You can have a whole lot more interpersonal time with someone fixing a car or digging a ditch with them than you ever have sitting there walking up to them and telling them about Jesus on the street. But if you help out your brother, you see your brother or sister in need and you're willing to meet their need, I want to tell you something. People be a lot more open whenever they're climbing here and you teach them how to climb, you teach them how to run, you teach them how to bounce in a bounce house, they'll listen to what you have to say more than me just walking up the street and saying, can I tell you about Jesus? So we're going to talk about how to build energy. 
Listen, God wants to pour out His Spirit. It's going to be amazing. Some of the things we're going to talk about in the coming weeks aren't going to be real exciting. You might walk out of here and go, that hurt. But you see what God's trying to do in those moments is to pull the resistance out of your life so that more of Him can flow through you. If you meet people where God is flowing through that person, I will show you a person that has been in the tumbler. And has spun around and round and round and round and round and spent days spinning around and round. And they come out and you go, wow, that's a precious jewel. How many know cubic zirconias are easily made compared to a diamond? How many know they can fool most people without a trained eye? And you know they can fool jewelers unless they get out the microscope? You know how you can tell a diamond's real and a cubic zirconia is not? The diamond has flaws. A cubic zirconia doesn't have flaws. It's too pure because it's not in the environment. And the same thing happens with all of us. Listen, we've all got flaws. How many know that? But you also know this about a diamond, and I'm closing. The less flaws in a diamond, the more expensive the diamond. Anyone can, and I'm not a great jeweler. I don't know a whole lot about it, but if you go buy a VS3 diamond, it has a lot of flaws. If you buy a VS2, it has a little less flaws. If you buy a VS1, it's getting a little more pure. And you can go that whole line, and then you'll sit there and you'll say, this diamond here is really expensive. And you're like, it's so little. This is because it's a good diamond. I want you to get that. It's how God looks at us. He wants to get the flaws out of us. The flaws take time to leave. It takes running to win. It takes training. It takes work. It takes sweat. It takes labor. It takes pain. It takes conviction. It takes prayer. It takes reading. It takes worship. It takes getting alone with God. All those things. I want you to run to win this year. But it's going to take time. Would you stand with me this morning? God's doing a new thing. He said, behold, I do a new thing. Do you not see it? It springs forth. I like going to Christian concerts. I miss Christian concerts. I've tried to watch some online. Can I tell you, they're just not the same. I can turn up the music and watch all those things. They're not the same. The experience is so much better when it's live. Can I tell you something? With God, it's the same way. You can walk into a concert and get that feel for a moment and, and sit there and it's amazing. And you can watch from a distance where you're not totally involved. You know, I look at it this way. For me to go to a concert takes work. For me to go online takes a finger. How many know what I'm talking about? I just got to scroll over YouTube. There it is, concert. Yep, all right. You know, there's all kind of live conferences right now. I don't attend any of them. Why? Because I get bored. I like watching people's faces. I like being around other people. I like sitting there and breaking bread with people and eating with people and, and sitting there and smiling at people and, and, and all those kind of things. People make life fun, don't they? Because we're a relationship. That's what we are. It's a relationship. We love relationships. God wants that same relationship with you. That's why we need, as the world calls it, church. It's experience. I can experience it anywhere, but there's something that happens when I make myself uncomfortable. Whoever came up with Sunday morning church, the one day you can sleep in and you got to get up. I'm sure you've asked yourself that question a few times, didn't you? It's called the sacrifice. God loves it. Father, I thank you and I praise you, God, that you're pouring out your spirit. I praise you, God, that you're ready to do a tsunami in 2021, that God will be so amazing. God, we pray for an awakening, the great awakening, that God, people will be saved and transformed and changed and full of the Holy Spirit and on fire for God. We pray, God, that you would just pour out your spirit in such supernatural ways that, God, you would just move 
uh, evil out of the way and just wash it away. That God, that water, I literally witnessed it as a kid. And Lord, when I was a, a little boy in the flood of Johnstown where I saw stones moved and houses moved and campers moved and, and cars moved. And Lord, I saw all that stuff just with the power of water. And God, I pray that you'll do that in our lives. That your kingdom would come, that your will would be done, that your name would be praised. God, I pray for these people. And God, I love them. I mean that, God. You know I talk to you about them all the time. And God, I pray for them here. That God, they'll be willing to learn to run to win. Lord, I pray it in Jesus' name. That God, as we get deep with you, that they'll be willing to go in. And we'll give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. I want to leave you with a thought. You know, I like watching the Olympics. Anyone else in here like watching the Olympics? I, I sit amazed at people when I watch them. I'm like, how do they do that? I love watching the gymnasts who sit there and they do stuff. And I love watching the swimmers and the runners and the, all these people that are just amazing. Just, I sit there literally amazed, like, wow. And then you realize, and I like it when they tell their story. Because, you know, we just think it happens, right? We just think, well, it's just going to happen. And then you realize all the sacrifice they had for that one moment, that one opportunity, that one place to compete, that's what God's trying to tell us to run to win. You see, it's that moment when God just says, I'm going to use you to change the world right now. And I got all the resistance out of you, and he plugs you, and you're like, woo! And all of a sudden, people are healed and delivered and set free. And they're like, man, what happened? And it's all about that preparation. The preparation's never the fun time. You don't see the times right now where those Olympic athletes that are going to be in the Olympic Games the next eight years from now, they're out there right now running in the winter snow. They're in the gym lifting weights. You don't see all the work they're putting into it. All you're going to see is, oh, they're my favorite. Did you see the way he dove off that diving board? Man, that was really crazy. I wish I could be like that. There's a chance you could have been if you're willing to put in the work. God says the same thing to you spiritually. Becoming something for God is going to be work. But when the power starts flowing and God starts doing you, you will amaze people, and it'll be worth it all. When you stand on that podium, and God says, well done, you ran to win, and you ran well. I love you. It'll be worth it all. Now, listen, that podium isn't just at the end of your life. There's times in, where it's amazing. You're walking with God, and God's like, I'm so proud of you. You know how cool it is to have God say, I'm proud of you? So we're going to learn to run. It's not always going to be fun, but we're going to train ourselves to run. We're going to make up our mind we're going to run well. We're going to make up our mind we're going to love people. I'm telling you, they're going to come and they're going to climb and they're going to have fun and they're going to crawl through tunnels and they're going to play video games. And man, you're going to be there and you're going to be like, I really don't want to be here tonight. And that's going to be a night some little kid's going to go up and give you a hug and say, I love you. And their mom or dad's going to walk over and go, you know, they really like you. What's up? Well, yeah. You know, it's really cool. What what are you here for? Because I just love people. Do you think we could come to church too? They'll ask you things like that. Can I come here? I love saying no. And then, of course, I have to tell them I'm kidding, but it really throws them off. And they're like, can I come? No. That's what it's all about, church. It's those moments when you're touching a world, helping families, changing lives. God bless you. Jesus loves you and thinks you're amazing. And I want to tell you what, we're going to learn to run like we've never ran before. And we're going to learn to love like we've never loved before. And we're going to see a tsunami like we've never seen before. And you're the tsunami. And you're going to get into people's lives. They're going to be like, what happened? And they're going to be like, I got a hold of Jesus now. I'm going to give you some power. Glory to God. God loves you. He thinks you're amazing. Have a great day in Jesus Christ. Get a donut on your way out, a coffee. If you're new, please let us know that you're new so we can stay in touch with you. Because we want to. God bless you.